Good morning. Welcome to worship. It was Doug Hammarskjöld who said that immortal line, for all that has been, thanks. For all that shall be, yes. And this morning we find ourselves at the intersection between what has been with all the glory of Christmas and what shall be with the promises of God for our future. So we welcome all of you to this special day of worship. We're especially glad that there are a number of guests. I look around to see which with us. We're delighted that you've added to our company. We have an all-star lineup. It's the Sunday after Christmas. So we have Rachel Litter leading us in children's sermon, and Tina and Liz with music. We're thankful for Reverend Dr. Don Phillips, longtime Methodist minister, member of our church, now retired, uh, to lead us in the proclamation of the word today. So I know that this is sometimes what ministers call low Sunday, but I always think this is the kind of thing that Jesus just loves to come to us in the humble place because you have come here and because he has come here. Let us know a special divine communion and let us truly worship. So as Dr. Skinner leads us in preparing for worship, I invite you, maybe as we come to the end of this year, to let it be a time of being in touch with all the gifts that God has given you this past year. So let us worship him in fullness and in spirit and in truth. As we continue to worship and celebrate the birth of our Savior, I ask that you turn to hymn number 126. Hymn number 126, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Stand together, please. Guys, it's so good to see you this morning. So I know it's the middle of winter, but it is pretty warm outside. So I have a summer-related question I wanted to ask you guys. Have any of you ever been to a summer camp? I have. A few of you? Okay. So when I was about y'all's age or maybe a little older, I went to a summer camp that I stayed at overnight for a whole week. And one of the biggest things I remember was the place that we went every day for worship. So I brought a picture of it for you guys. And if you can see, there's benches out in front. That's kind of like our pews. And in the very front, there's a huge cross. And behind it, you can see the mountains and the trees. And a, there's a sunset in this picture. Um, and I think I remember this not only because it was so beautiful, but I also remember the cross being there and knowing that God was there too. So now I'm gonna share with you guys a story from Exodus. It's the second book in the Bible and it's about Moses and the burning bush. Moses was taking care of the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. As he led the sheep to the far side of the desert, he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The messenger of the Lord appeared to him there as flames of fire coming up out of a bush. Moses looked, and although the bush was on fire, it was not burning up. So he thought, why isn't this bush burning up? I must go over there and see this strange sight. When the Lord saw that Moses had come over to see it, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. 
Moses answered, Here I am. God said, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, because this place where you are standing is holy ground. So Moses, in this story, was surrounded by nature, just like I was at that summer camp. But it wasn't any place like this, like in my picture, or the sanctuary that was set up and designated as a place to worship God. God created the whole world, and we can see him in the mountains, or in the trees, or in our friends, or in a burning bush. Anywhere we go, God is with us, and anywhere God is can become holy ground. So we just celebrated Christmas, right? Can you guys tell me the place where baby Jesus was born? Where was he born, Kimball? Right, in a manger. Um, and he wasn't born anywhere fancy. Um, and that manger was made holy by God because Jesus was there. We don't have to worship and experience God when, only when we are at church or somewhere we think of as a holy place. Because God is always with us, this can happen when you are in your room at home praying or on your way to school or anywhere you go. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for always being with us. Thank you for sending us Jesus, who was born in a manger. Please help us to see you wherever we go. In your name we pray. Amen. As we go to God in prayer, I invite you especially to keep in prayer Robert Harmony. Robert's father died unexpectedly uh, yesterday morning. They are making funeral arrangements as I speak. So be in prayer for Robert, if you will. Well, let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, our help in ages past our hope for years to come. As we find ourselves here in this last Sunday of the year of our Lord, 2019, we look back and we remember that your goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our lives. And we now look forward and know that that same goodness and mercy will go before us into whatever our new year may bring. As we find ourselves at the intersection of what has been and what might be, may we place you at the very heart of that journey. You have carried us through this past year. Some in this room have known terrible loss, awful grief, unimaginable mountains to climb. Others have known surprising joy, Deep, deep celebrations, wonderful love. All of us have found life. We pray that as we live through the lives that are ours, that you will be our unseen companion, that you will hold our hand, that all our times will be in your hands, and that we can trust all our future days just as you have carried us to this very holy and happy day this very morning. And so we give you thanks, oh God. Maybe this year has not been all some would want it to be, but you are all that we need you to be. And so carry us forward. Lead on, O oh King Eternal. May our best days be still before us. Until that day we see you face to face. And so I pray for every person here, not only a happy new year, but a joy filled new year. A year where at the end of it, they will have a little more experience of your love and mercy. A year where at the end of it, they will be closer to you instead of further away from you. Oh God, I pray the same for this church, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit, that the, greater, the greatest days are still yet before us, that we will be a witness to your goodness and mercy, that we will be a shining light to an increasingly darkened world, and that we will be witnesses to the difference that Jesus Christ can make. We pray 
as we have prayed every week, that all of this prayer we pray will find its fullness in you. So hear us again this morning as we pray our best prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Two show and tells. One, a letter dated June 6, 1969. When I finished seminary, I wrote to every professor who taught me 
And this was a response, the only response that I received. Uh, dear Mr. Phillips, your letter was finally forwarded from the seminary to the hospital. My classes were over there by the time your letter arrived at the seminary. Your letter, I believe, was about the shortest one I have ever received, consisted it, consisting of only two sentences. However, it meant just as much to me as some I have received two pages long. There is just not much else to say when you, have th when you thank one for what he has taught you and say you are glad he is a part of your seminary education. No one ever learns so much or gets too old to have his heart gladdened by genuine appreciation. Thank you for taking the time to drop me a note. Sincerely, Richard K. Young, Department of Pastoral Care, Bum Gray Hospital. The second is a plaque given to me by Ione and Kenneth Neese, who were my members in Emanuel United Methodist Church in Burlington. And they gave this to me uh, in June of 1982. And it reads, The Pastor Study. The pastor study is a symbol of the calling of the Christian minister to be the shepherd of the flock of God. Here, summoned or prepared to feed the congregation on God's holy word. Here, the work of the congregation is planned so that the congregation may grow in grace and bear fruit in fellowship, teaching, and witnessing. Here, you will always find a friend and counselor in time of need. He will not be surprised at your sins, nor will he judge you in them. But he always invites you to share with him the wisdom and love of God, the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins, and the saving grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are always welcome. Two show and tells that I hope will add to the sermon later on. sermon title is A Sacred Place, and I want to thank the staff who placed the scripture lesson in the bulletin, and if you will follow along with me as I read these scripture passages, and I felt it was much easier to have it before you rather than you going to Exodus and then to Samuel and then to the New Testament. So let's look at uh, Samuel, and you've already heard part of it here. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave, at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink of the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did the three mighty men. And then from Exodus. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, while the bush is not burnt. 
When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then from that passage in Luke. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. A sacred place. Our seminary professor in the pastoral care class that day when I was working on my Master of Divinity degree, was talking to the class, and he said to those of us that day, boys, and there were no women in the class, he said, boys, when you finish school here, most of you are going to be pastors. Some of you are going to be hospital chaplains. Some of you are going to be full-time military chaplains. You may be counselors, whatever. He said, from time to time, someone may stop you on a street corner and say, I need to talk with you. They may stop you in the post office. They may see you on the street and want to get into your car. They may come to your office at the church. You may go into their home. You may go into their hospital room. At any rate, when they do, and they want to talk with you, they are going to dare let down their defenses and expose themselves and talk to you about their hurts and their hopes and their dreams and their sins. And he said, boys, when they do, you had better take off your shoes because you're walking on the hallowed ground of the human soul. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And I've never forgotten it. You're walking on the hallowed ground of the human soul when you, as a called man or woman of God, encounter someone in a counseling situation and they dare expose themselves and come to you with their hurts and their hopes and their dreams and their possibilities. It's a sacred place when they open up their hearts and their minds, hence that show and tell. And I've never forgotten that. And so anytime anyone has come to me, no matter the setting, I've shared one of those two things. I'm not surprised at what they've done. They always have a friend and they're welcome. And I thank them for allowing me to walk on the hallowed ground of the human soul. Well, in this scripture, David and his army are surrounded and he is tired of drinking the old stale water. They are surrounded. And he says longingly, oh, I wish I had a drink of water from the cool, refreshing well back at Bethlehem. And the three chief, bravest, strongest, most loyal three of the 30 men hear him say it. He didn't issue an order. It was just an offhanded comment. I sure do wish I had a, a, water from the, a drink of water from the old well back at Bethlehem. And they took the initiative to break through the opposing enemy's line, not once but twice, broke through the line, went to Bethlehem, retrieved the water, and brought it back. Went through the enemy line once, came back through the enemy line and presented that gift at the risk of their own lives. And when David realized what he had done, oh, it's too precious. I'm not going to drink that water. I'm going to pour it out. It's too precious a gift. And he poured it out on the ground. It was a sacred place, a sacred place. 
made holy and precious by their love and their devotion and their loyalty. One writer has said, David's hand accomplished many things as he held a sword, as he held a spear, and as he strummed a harp. But the finest thing that David ever did was with a cup of water. For in making it a drink offering to the Lord as he did that day, he revealed his true character. Isn't that a beautiful quote? Mother Teresa has said, you and I can do no great things, only small things with great love. That's a beautiful picture. A sacred place, that ground around David that day when he realized love and devotion and loyalty. It was a sacred place. I remembered that in my ministry. And I think since I'm 81 years old, I have the right to make observations in life, an observation as I have observed people in life and as a minister. I have observed in life that there are not only places in a church that could be a sacred place, but there are sacred places in your life and there are sacred places in my life that are common. And I thought about that, a sacred place. So let's you and I mention some of them. They are common to each of us and let's look at them. Number one, how about beside the bed of a loved one? You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. Those midnight, two o'clock, lonely bedside vigils, beside the bed of a loved one, beside a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter, when they are sick, when they're not expected to live, when some, some unknown disease strikes, when you wipe a fevered brow, when you swab lips when they're suffering, when you pour out your heart in love and devotion, or when someone else pours out their heart and their love and devotion toward you, it's a sacred place in a hospital room, in a rest home. Someone in a hospital room, in a home, swabbing a brow, holding a hand. It's a sacred place beside the bed of a loved one. A second place for me was at High Point College, now High Point University. I studied there my undergraduate education. I took Christian education courses. I learned and I studied and I went to the library and I went into a history class one day and I met Betty Spencer Jones from Kinston, North Carolina. Brown eyes, brown hair, and I sat two seats behind her and Dr. Stuart Deskins knew I was paying more attention to her than I was history. And uh, I began to notice her more than anything else, and we began to date. I called it courting then. And uh, I would walk her back and forth to the dorm. And time went by, and one night, I don't remember the date, but I remember what I said. I was about to pop, and uh, behind Robert's Hall, we were walking back and I stopped and I said, Betty, I've got something to say to you. I think I, and I said, nope, there's no thinking about it. I love you. And I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Now to me, High Point College is a sacred place. Two people 
met, made a commitment uh, for marriage, 55 years now and counting. Faithfulness in marriage lives, uh, cast their lives together. You met your husband or wife there. You were educated somewhere. There's a special place in your heart and mind. You know where it is. It's a special place. Another special place. Why are you here this morning? Why are you allowed to be here? Special place. How about uh, Washington? Washington. Vietnam, the tomb of the unknown soldier. What about Normandy? What about those places that they represent? What about those lives lost when they stormed that beach at Normandy? That's why we're here, because so many people gave their lives that you and I could be here. Some of us have been to Washington. Betty's cousin gave his life, and his name is on the uh, wall there at uh, Vietnam Wall, like to visit there, have visited there. But to me, there's nothing like the tomb of the unknown soldier. Most people stand and watch the guard as he walks back and forth. I don't like to do that. I like to go and stand and watch the guard walk toward me. My hair stands on the back of my neck when I realize what this country means. Tomb of the unknown soldier, Normandy, the beachhead. That's sand just like any other place. That's just a beach. No, mm -mm. it's a special place. That's marble there, that tomb. Mm -mm. No, not marble, it's a special place. very special place very very special place well another special place is where they're buried how about where your parents are buried a special place I want to tell you about uh, my mom and daddy my mama quit school in the fifth grade and my daddy quit school in the third grade to go work in a mill. And the Courier Times in Roxborough, my hometown paper, in 1981 published a centennial edition. And they have a picture in there of everyone that was working in the Roxborough cotton mill. My mama was 14 years old, working in a cotton mill. They didn't own a car until after I was married. And they sacrificed for me to go to college. Where they're buried in Roxborough, it's grass, it's dirt, just like any other place. Mm -mm, no, mm -mm. it's not just dirt and grass there. It's special because of love and devotion toward me. What about your mamas and daddies, where they're buried? Your grandmamas and granddaddies, people that loved you, where they're buried? It's special. What about a desk or table where you write your checks? Where you pay your bills, where you provide for your family, where you provide for your education, where you buy your shoes and your insurance, braces, braces for your children's teeth, and where you write your check for your church. It's where you, as you write that check, thank God for your health and your job and your work. And where you thank God for how God has blessed you. And where you ask God to help your money last till the end of the month. Where you ask God to give you wisdom to save and spend money wisely. And it's where, as you write that check, you 
offer back to God with joy and excitement and enthusiasm because you're undergirding the work of God. Where you write the check to pay rent and doctor's bills and drugs and, and also where you support missionaries that are going to carry the work of the church all around the world. A desk, a table, more than that. You're doing Lord's work when you write that check to the church. How about a sacred place beside the bed of a loved one? I point college for me, special place, you got your own. Normandy, Washington, Vietnam, a grave, a desk, a table. And then finally an altar. And for me, it's uh, Queen Street United Methodist Church in Kinston. I was married there. I conducted Betty's mother and father's funeral, Queen Street United Methodist Church. Grace Methodist Church in Roxborough, I joined the church there, I grew up there. Bethany Methodist Church, I was licensed to preach there in Durham. Rocky Mount First United Methodist Church, I was ordained deacon there, the altar of those churches. University United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill. I was brought in full connection in the Methodist Church there, ordained elder. Masses Chapel United Methodist Church in Durham. Our daughter Margaret was baptized there. Mount Bethel United Methodist Church in Bahama. Our daughter Mary Beth and Donald, our son, were baptized there. The churches where I have served as a pastor, where I have knelt along with other people. An altar where you and I stand, where we come and we marry, we commit ourselves to one another in marriage. An altar where we bring our loved ones in death and where we thank God for their lives. Is it just a piece of wood down here? How about last Sunday morning when all of these parents and all of these children stood here? Is it just wood down there? Mm -mm. It's a special place down here. This is special because of love and devotion. These parents are going to be reading the Bible to their children. It's not wood. It's more than that. Is this just tiled in here? Mm -hmm. Special. Red Craddock was professor of preaching at Emory. He died recently when he was a young pastor. He was serving a church at Enid, Oklahoma, a small church. He said one night it had rained, terrible rainstorm. He lived miles away in a terrible rainstorm, they had to call off the service, and they couldn't get word to him. And so two men that lived close to the church, they walked to the church and were waiting for him because they knew he would come to the church to conduct the worship service that night. So Fred Craddock said he got in his car and drove up that old muddy road, slipping and sliding in his car, and got to the church. Service had been called off, and he said he walked into the church, a real small church, and the two men were sitting there playing cards on the altar. And he walked in, and he said, what's going on? They said, well, it had a big rainstorm, said, we're not going to have service tonight. It's been called off. He said, I know, but what are you doing? They said, we're just playing some poker right here. He said, on that table, the one that says, in remembrance of me, they said, yeah, a table's just a table. Uh-uh, <laughs> no. A table's just a table, it's just made out of wood. No. Special place. Special place. Dear God, thank you for blessing us. And thank you for giving us special places. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. 
So our hymn of invitation is hymn number 143, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Maybe there are some this morning who want to give their life to Christ, or you might be this church from another church family, or some renewed commitment. I'll be the front to receive you. Let us stand this thing to the glory of God, hymn number 143. Welcome to those who are guests with us. We're delighted that you've added to our company. We have a guest welcome center over to the side. We'd love for you to stop by if you'd like to have more information about our church. Mike Dishman from our outreach team would be happy to connect with you. So, Happy New Year. And let us bow them for the benediction. Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ within you. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. Love, all love, Jesus Christ our Lord, thanks be to God.